Well, we're going to change um, horses here a little bit and not be talking about the regulatory stuff so much. Um, I am a private sector archaeologist, just uh, similar to um, many of you. Uh, I've been actually doing this for almost 40 years, 30, 40 years, and uh, I, work, I work primarily in the western United States. Uh, I, uh, my wife and I, um, Anne, have owned a company for 30 years and then we, we sold recently. And um, working for the company that we uh, that that uh, purchased us, but I want to I want to I want to go back and, and talk about just a little bit about what Terry did. Terry Terry described a great a, a great uh, discussion about Section 106 uh, as the process of the National Historic Preservation Act, and that is what what probably 90 percent of our work is um, in in the private sector. Um, it's uh, um, uh, primarily, in, in the, especially the area that we work in, there's literally millions of acres of federally owned land that we work on. And it isn't only federal projects that, that because of federal land that we, that we do projects, it's because there, there are uh, companies that are privately, or that are, that are federally funded uh, to, uh, to, to do work. There are uh, lots of uh, companies that end up needing uh, permits from the federal government, and anytime the government is involved in a project, if there's a hook of any sort, um, generally the uh, archaeology work that needs to be done, as well as the uh, architectural history, sometimes history. Um, in, uh, uh, the, it wasn't always this way. Before, before the um, uh, Historic Preservation Act, um, archaeology was done here and there, but not, not to a great extent. It wasn't until uh, after that act passed, it was probably 10 years may or maybe more before regulations actually began to be written to the point where they actually had some teeth and could, could re start requiring agencies to do and, and uh, developers to do what they needed to do. And early, during those early years, the 70s, early 80s, uh, universities were, were dominant in doing the work that uh, is primarily done by private consultants now. The, uh, the university programs, they were already established uh, they, they, they had archaeologists on staff, they had students available, so it was natural. And I, and I know that happens here as well, although it's lessening here as well. But uh, university programs were, were a natural for this, and, and there was a lot of, a lot of work. I, uh, uh, in fact, one of my first jobs was working for the University of Arizona on, on huge uh, pipeline projects, or water aqueduct projects in Arizona. Um, but over time, um, Universities began to find that they were not um, the best equipped for this. Now, there's still universities that do this, but, but many of them found that they really weren't the best equipped. They had um, uh, uh, um, research roles, they had teaching roles that weren't consistent with actually getting a job done over a short period of time on a certain budget. Um, in fact, they're terrible at those kinds of things. Um, so, and that is where we excel far, far better than, than those people, uh, which is why a lot of companies, a lot of uh, our clients uh, prefer to work with, with private consultants because they do understand their needs. Um, and so by the 1990s, 2000s, it becomes, uh, an, an, our, our, the private sector archaeology becomes dominant in the United States. The, um, and as that, as that happened, um, by 1995, there were, there were actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these companies that were, uh, uh, had been formed in the United States. And then some came and went, uh, some became very large, and, and we in fact have some right now that are, that are in excess of 100 people, some even 200 at times. Uh, but we, uh, uh, there, there was enough, enough of a, of a uh, critical mass, it seems, that uh, there was a, a desire on the part of a number of, of companies to join together to become uh, a trade association. And so in 1995, the, the American Cultural Resources Association, which, is, which, which has some parallels with fame in, in uh, Britain, uh, was formed. And uh, it, it included, I, I don't know, we were, we were less than 100 companies at that time, 
but it still still represented a significant number of uh, companies across, especially large companies that were that were uh, in existence in the country at that time. Um, we saw that uh, our our role was to to help companies um, to to talk to to agencies. It was a way to buffer buffer individual conversations that might otherwise be be difficult to have with with federal agencies, with uh, even even with uh, client industries like mining industry and, uh, and such. Um, and uh, right now we have more than 140 companies uh, with over a thousand people represented in each each of those companies. The the company who is a member and, and each company is a member of the uh, of the American Cultural Resources Association. All of their employees are also members. So it's. Um, it, it, it's much larger than it actually appears um, in the uh, in the um, uh, when you look at 140 companies. While we we don't we can't say for sure, it, it appears that that represents about 10 percent of the uh, organization of the of the companies that are in existing in the United States. Uh, there was a, a survey done, uh, it wasn't just a survey actually, it was research that was done that, that came up with uh, in 2008 about, the estimate is there are probably 1,500 archeological companies, and they aren't just archeology, span but most are archeology, span uh, in the United States. And some of them, as I said, are maybe more than 100 people. Uh, most are probably two, three, four, five individuals in a company. But there still are 1,500. We have, as I said, about 140 of those, and that was eight years ago when that when that study was done. So, so there there are there are probably a lot more than that. Um, the estimate also is that the uh, the private sector in the United States generates probably about a billion dollars of revenue a year, which is about equivalent to what the uh, the EU. Uh, um, uh, countries do in over over here. Um, that is a really squishy number, so it's 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 hard to get you know to, to be able to to uh, uh, verify that. But but it's in that range, and so it, it gives you a magnitude idea of how much work is actually being done. So the question is, what what? Do all of these archaeologists do to make that, you know, to, to, to generate that billion dollars um, and make their companies profitable as well? There's companies, as I said, there are more than 100. Uh, most are not. But we work in a variety, wide variety of industries, just as you do here. But there's probably, it's, it's probably even, even wider because of the, the uh, uh, variability of the, of the uh, geography there. Uh, there's there's highway development, of course. That's that's one of the, that's one of the big ones. But but also oil and gas development, uh, mining, telecommunications, solar and wind energy developments. Uh, and that's largely in, and then largely in the western United States, we have lots and lots of water development because that's one of the areas. Um, I'm sure as you've seen in the news with California and other uh, western states, the drought has created real crisis, and water development has always been big there. And the development of of um, uh, pipelines, water pipelines, which which my company is involved in, uh, canals for irrigation, uh, where where there's not enough uh, rainfall to uh, to grow crops, is a huge huge uh, uh, part of some companies' work. The um, a vital question. It really lurks in the background of, of, of this work and um, is is about standards when when I, when our when the uh, uh, private sector first began there really wasn't a lot of thought about that there were always standards universities have standards and uh, you know I don't know how much professors teach that I just I certainly didn't have a course on ethics but uh, early on uh, in the in the 1960s 70s uh, people just did work and there was an assumption that people had standards 
1974 came along, uh, the Society for um, uh, um, Professional Archaeologists began, which is the precursor to the Register of Professional Archaeologists. It was an attempt to begin to get a handle on that and to kind of quantify what um, archaeologists should be doing, standards uh, that Terry and, and uh, Pete were talking about. Uh, this was early on, and uh, th this eventually morphed in 1998 into the register. But um, what kind of standards did archaeologists follow in the 1950s and 60s? Um, they weren't developed. Uh, and what's, what's really interesting, I found, when I went, went looking for this, I found um, actually a, uh, a, a number of organizations who are quite familiar in the United States we're, we're familiar with um, when they actually began to develop ethical standards, and I was rather surprised. Every one of them, and this is this is not just in the United States; it's in it's the EAA, it's the Australian Archaeological Association. I'll just give you I'll just give you a, a quick list here. The uh, when they actually developed their ethical standards, and I'm not saying that archaeologists didn't have them before this, but these were when they were just codified. Archaeological Institute of America, the AIA, was 1991. Australian Archaeological As Association was 1991. The Australian Association of Consulting Archaeologists was 1980. Now, that's, a, that's early. Uh, Canadian Archaeological Association was 1999. European Association of Archaeologists, 1997. Uh, the Society for Historical Archaeology, 1993. World Archaeological Congress, 1990. And the uh, AAA, um, uh, this, this is the American Culture, uh, um, Anthropological Association, which Terry was talking about. They didn't really have a code uh, or, or a, or a sta set of standards, but they had what they called principles of professional responsibility in 1971. So it wasn't really a ethical uh, standards, but it was, it was something. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of time frame we're talking about fairly, fairly recently. Uh, so so it's, yeah, I, I find that, that quite interesting, and I, 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 was, I was rather surprised. Um, there's, there's a lot of issues that, are, that have become difficult um, when, when one is uh, dealing with, with uh, um, standards and ethics. Um, the uh, <coughs> There are so many issues that uh, one, one runs into, especially when you're dealing with clients. Private sector archaeologists get in trouble uh, because they, they uh, uh, get squeezed between agencies, requirements, they get squeezed uh, uh, on the other side between their clients' demands. And um, many times that's when we end up with our cases that Terry mentioned, the 10 cases or more sometimes a year is archaeologists get stupid or they get pressured so much that they feel they, they just need to do something. And so they end up um, violating what they probably know is not what they should be doing, but they do it anyway. Uh, sometimes it's just to, to, to make sure they, get, they, they, they can keep afloat in their company. But it's, it's one, of the, one of the reasons that we need these kinds of, of standards is to be able to fall back on them and have, and, and, and also, have people not get in those kinds of situations, at least as often. Uh, it, it, is, it is definitely a, a uh, problem for a lot of, of archaeologists. And when you consider that there's probably, this is a, from this study again, there are about 14,000 archaeologists in the US, 8,000 of them in the private sector. That's a lot of people in a lot of different kinds of situations dealing with a very um, few people in the federal bureaucracy who oversee this. So there's a lot of room for, for problems to develop. We, um, and as I, I was talking about before, we have 
common standards that we that we uh, have among ourselves that we've developed, but um, our our uh, uh, the need is for a for a, for more. Uh, I don't know if I want to say enforcement, but certainly more people to 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 uh, uh, buy into the process that RPA uh, has has initiated. I think it's really important that uh, private sector uh, archaeologists do this. Now there's there's uh, 2,900 professional archaeologists members. As I said, there's 14,000 archaeologists out there, either in the academic institutions the government, or the private sector. So we have a long way to go still. I know CIFA also, we have maybe half. Yeah, that's, you're, you're way ahead of the, the game there. So um, that's pretty much what I, what I had to say here. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be really interested to have some dialogue with you because I think we have a lot of things in common as, as uh, professional uh, uh, private consultants. Um, and I look forward to discussing with you. Thank you.